Check one, two. Good evening and aloha. Welcome to Surf of the Bar. Aloha ahi ahi to all of you. And welcome to a special edition of Talk Story Night. So what these nights uh, are for, uh, these Talk Story Nights, it's basically a chance to uh, learn some information, share some knowledge, share some stories. Going back to ancient Hawaiian culture, there was no written language. So it was a majority oral communication. So storytelling, mo'olelo, as we call it in Hawaii, was the main form of communication uh, through the villages, uh, from the top down and, uh, and, and back up. So there was um, a very, very close sense of culture with the sharing of stories. So, with Turtle Bay's transformation and uh, part of renaming and remodeling this space here into Surf of the Bar with this lovely stage that did not always exist here, we did uh, keep the tradition alive of Talk Story. And uh, Turtle Bay, once again, is now um, a very community minded resort. So, the North Shore community. Um, has been rallying around uh, the transformation of Turtle Bay, the recent rebranding, and reopening of a brand new and improved Turtle Bay. And so part of that reopening, part of one of our brand pillars, is to continue the tradition of mo'olelo, of sharing stories through a talk story event uh, tonight. And I have to say, and a round of applause, mahalo to Turtle Bay Resort and Surf of the Bar for continuing this Hawaiian tradition. And I also would like to acknowledge and give a round of applause for Jody Wilmot, who was instrumental in developing these nights. So please give it up for Jody Wilmot. We are featuring this. You might notice some cameras around. We are recording, and we are featuring this live, I believe, right now on WatermanLeague.com. So just how it sounds, WatermanLeague.com. If you have maybe a, a family member or a friend who's in the mainland and possibly still awake, you can send them the link. Um, or they can watch a recorded version on surfofthebar.com. But tonight, we are celebrating one of, another one of our Turtle Bay and North Shore brand pillars, which is to be a waterman. I'm not talking about the guys that deliver water to the baseball players that are sitting on the bench or the uh, water boys um, at the football game. These are actual watermen who participate in ocean activities at a very high level and a varied amount of uh, water activities and ocean activities. So tonight, we're going to uh, hear from two members of a very esteemed Hawaiian watermen family, the Kalama family. Uh, one of our um, uncles, uh, Uncle Boogie Kalama, was one of the first uh, to be hand-selected to be on the voyage of Hokulea down to Tahiti. And uh, the lineage just goes on. But I'd like to welcome to the stage our two watermen this evening. Please put your hands together for Kainoa McGee and Dave Kalama. Kainoa will not need a microphone. Wow, that's pretty loud. This is right there, Dave. And just flip the switch off. So for... No. There it is. Yeah. Yep. So for those of you that um, may be new to the sport of surfing or new to the waterman culture, uh, these two individuals um, have really 
in their own ways, have pioneered wave riding from the 80s through the 90s and up until the present day. And um, Kainoa, let's start with you, of um, maybe where you were born and where you kind of first got your feet wet, literally. Actually, it's a funny story because people know me now for surfing like Pipeline and big waves and everything. everybody thinks I was born and raised on the North Shore, but I'm actually a townie. South Shore <laughs> rules. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but I spent so much time out here. It's basically my second home. And I, I started in the water when I was about five years old. Uh, that's when the bodyboard first came out. And at the, we grew up in St. Louis Heights. is right up the road from Waikiki Beach. So straight down Waikiki Beach. And my mom's boyfriend at that time had a bodyboard. And those were the kit bodyboards. When, like, you yeah. bought it, they sent it to you in the box, and you, like, glued it all together. Oh, no way. Yeah, like, old school. <laughs> and, um, and then just, it literally all started from there, and um, uh, just got addicted. I think it's pretty standard. I uh, refer to surfing, or our water culture, as more of a disease, because <laughs> you can't help yourself. As, as yeah. much as you'd like to like do something else or do something that's you know not that oh the waves are up poof, you drop everything and my, the wife sitting there like really you know and like well it's been twenty something years hon you should know by now <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but it's you know it's it's what happens you know it's it's a kind of thing that takes over us because I think you know the ocean you're naturally surrounded by nature. Right, yeah. and there's that energy and that spirit, the uh, spiritual feeling that you feel in the water, being surrounded by nature and friends and family out there. And, and Dave, how about yourself? Um, where where was it that that you were born, and you know, what got you to the ocean? Well, I was born in Newport Beach, California, and what got me to the ocean was my dad. He was a surfer, um, like his father and his father and on down the line. Yes, sir. <laughs> and um, my first experience, I actually don't even remember. I was told I was a young baby, and he took me out on the board, so I had no choice in the matter. Right. But the first time I do remember going is when I was a seven, and my cousin, Kalana, took me and, and uh, got me on. And I remember the first wave I caught still. I was on a board that was seven six. My dad had shaped it, single fin, kind of old school Hawaiian gun in a way. <laughs> Had my name on the on the stringer, big redwood stringer, oh, and I caught nice. like Sick. I don't know, ten to twelve inch white water, <laughs> <laughs> and oh, being that. up, sliding across the water, and it was like like he said that moment right there, I got the virus, and I haven't been able to cure it. Yeah. So <laughs> it it was a pretty special moment. <laughs> and um, now, Dave, you carry the. Excuse me. Dave, you carry the, um, the Kalama name. Kainoa, how do you fit into the Kalama clan? That's funny. I was actually going to explain that. And so what happens is our parents are cousins. Okay. And my mom's maiden name is Kalama. Okay. And uh, my grandfather is Noah Kalama. Mm -hmm. And my great-grandfather is Noah Sr., Mm -hmm. And so in Newport, actually, they have a race, a Catalina race from Catalina to Balboa every year that's named after my great-grandfather. Oh, wow. And uh, my middle name is also Kalama. Is that a, a, a paddleboard race? Or? Uh, it's actually a canoe race. I'm not sure oh, if they okay. added any paddleboarding to it or anything. Which so they, Hawaiian canoe racing yeah, in o California. OC, yeah, six-man wow. six wow. race. Noah, our grandfather, uh, started the first outrigger canoe club in California. He had to go stateside. Um, used to live Kaimuki, but for work, um, he moved back, and my dad was still living in the house at that time, so he ended up going with him, and that's where my California connection comes in, and so okay. I, I spent some time in California when I was younger. When did you um, make the move, or when did you first, what's your first memories of Hawaii? I first came here for a family reunion um, in 78. Oh, a Kalama reunion. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Not a small matter. <laughs> That's one whole island, bro. 
And uh, that was sort of when I was baptized into the Hawaiian side of my family and uh, opened my eyes to the culture and the family and the surf and so much of what, you know, Hawaii is about. And uh, took that back to California with me when I went back and, and sort of dreamed about it someday, but never, never actually thought it'd become a reality. And uh, through a weird kind of serendipitous uh, events i ended up on maui yeah and and kainoa you you grew up here um going down to the waikiki wall uh the kapuhulu groin area and um honing your bodyboard skills when did you kind of come to uh an epiphany or realization that wow i could actually make this uh possibly a living i might be able to uh, pursue it as uh, not only a lifestyle, but as a way to get through life. Uh, funny, Dave and I and Kai Lenny were actually just talking about that earlier. Um, I think I got my first sponsor when I was 10 years old after I entered my first contest, and that was Mori Bodyboards and, you know, basically free product. You know, yeah. you grew up the way I did. We grew up on welfare, and, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. The ocean was free. You just had to get there. And uh, I, I remember prior to that, like, so mom would be like, so what do you want for Christmas? I'm all, a bodyboard. She goes, well, we ain't got no money for a bodyboard. <laughs> How's about a pair of fins? I'm like, okay, we got a pair of fins. So we got a pair of fins, not I, <laughs> right? So you go down to the beach, one person gets one fin, you get the other fin, and right on, we go for it. Um, you know, and then I got sponsored, so I was getting boards for free. And, you know, and that was uh, kind of how it all started. And then uh, I kept... Um, just competing, doing doing well, and you know, getting good results. And um, then by the time I was like 13 or 14, I started getting bigger and better sponsors. Was on the NSSA national team, and uh, was sponsored by Gotcha at that time. And as a national team member, sponsored by O'Neill, which you know, even way back then, were still two really big companies. Yeah. And um, actually, when I was 15 or 16, I think it was, yeah. The first time I went into the Gotcha office, never been to California before. Irvine. Yeah. <laughs> and um, went shopping. I was like, oh, kidding. Like, yeah, get whatever you want. I'm all, wait, are you sure you want me to grab whatever? Like, yeah, no worries. It's all good. So, wow, that's literally kid in a candy store. And um, I was sitting in the office with the team manager, Mike Crickshank, at that time. Yep, Crickshank. And uh, Michael Thompson walks in. And he goes, hey, Kaino McGee, nice. Uh, I'm Michael Thompson. He's the owner of Gotcha. And um, he's all, you know, you've been doing really well, and you know we're excited for your progress, and you know we'd like you to turn pro and send you on tour. And I was like, whoa! So like you're gonna pay for me to go on tour? He's all, yeah. Just talk to Mike about it. We've already had this discussion, and da da da. And I was like, wow, that's you know, it's an amazing opportunity yeah. at such a young age. And um, I actually turned them down. And and the reason. I did it, and the reason I told them was the one thing I want to do before I turn professional is graduate from high school. <laughs> that deserves some applause. Yeah. No, Believe you me, that was quite a feat for me to pull off. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because, you know, friends, our friends like John Shimoka and Sonny Garcia, I seen them do all that stuff, and, you know, see him having all the success, and all of that was great, but... After it all ends, you know, worst case scenario, you want to get a job or you want to go to school. Got to get a GED or now. And, you know, yeah. I said, like, you know, the, the least amount of education I'm going to get is going to at least be a high school diploma. And, and Dave, for you, um, you know, growing up in California, kind of having your first taste of Hawaii uh, through, through some family and those dreams of, of coming back, um, when was it? When you came back, that you were kind of on that on that realization of this is something that I really want to dedicate myself to, and um, not only it's always for the passion first, but then you also like okay, I'm growing up, I gotta like get a job or pay bills or how can I make this take care of that? Well, when was uh, the first thought of that in your mind? When I first moved to Maui back in July second, nineteen eighty five, arrived at twelve thirty on United flight. Might have been 35. <laughs> it wasn't that, you know, 
You sort of remember it. Just sort of remember it. <laughs> was really uh, a significant day. I remember driving to the beach and watching the sugar cane sway and just like, I made it, man. I'm in paradise. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I honestly came here with, with no expectations, no real goal. I was trying to be a ski racer. It didn't pan out. Mm. So I took a turn from where I thought I was going, and that put me on Maui and windsurfing and... Um, it was huge in the 80s. It was huge. It was huge. And I just did it all day, every day. First guy at the beach, last one to leave. And I just loved it, whether it was good or not. And um, I think that passion and that love that, that grew from it ultimately allowed me the opportunity to have some success in that sport. And the more I windsurfed, the more I surfed. Because mm -hmm. once I started making money from it, I didn't have to work you know, restaurants or all that. Right. So I'd surf all morning, windsurf all afternoon, and if it glassed off, I'd go surf again. Yeah. And I found that, that the surfing helped the windsurfing, and the, and the windsurfing helped the surfing. Just So the story is, get on a wave as much as you possibly can, because you never know where it can take you right. if you really fall in love with it. Yeah. And so I did, and opportunity came from it, because I had success, and... Um, here I am now, 30 years later, basically, and uh, it, I've gone so far past what I ever expected or wanted, and I, I am having fun. Huh, Cuz? Well, yes, I, sir. I, I, I'm, I'm a, yeah, we can give applause for that, for sure. Yes. I'm just, I'm just a generation or so behind you guys, maybe two, but... Uh, Don't I, flatter yourself. <laughs> Easy tiger. I, I rem, I rem, no, I, my point being is that uh, I remember in the 80s, I was a grom, flipping through magazines, watching things on TV, and you guys' names, I mean, you could ask me any time during that time, like, who's Dave Kalama, who's Kano McGee? I knew exactly what you guys did, what you're up to in that, um, at that time, because, you know, I grew up surfing here, too, and I, I had this aspirations, and so seeing these guys, you know, throughout my youth in magazines, on TV shows, in videos, and now sitting here with them now is like super exciting for me. So, um, Dave, who are some of the guys that uh, influenced you during your, um, your kind of, your rise? Well, I'd say the first person that probably had the most influence was my father. He was the 1962 U.S. Amateur Champion, and while my parents split up when I was young, he, he sort of almost became this mythical figure for me. Besides just being my dad, he was, he was a surfer, and he was really good, and everybody knew him, and he was cool. And so that sort of attracted me to surfing when I was young, because I was like, you know, I want to be like my dad. And then when I got into it and, and learned who the people were and saw the movies, in fact, I remember, oh, God, I want to say it was like 74. Five ish. I was sitting in the Mesa, back row, one of the youngest kids in the movie theater. Five Summer Stories was playing, <laughs> and uh, Jerry Lopez would come up on the screen. The theater would just go wild, you know, and I'm in the back, and it smells kind of funny from something, I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> and just watching all of this, and it was like, man, I want to be Jerry Lopez, I want to be Bertleman, I want to be Buttons. These guys are ripping the hardest, you know, mm -hmm. Mark Lydell. They look like they're ripping the hardest, having the most fun. And so those were probably the guys that I tried to emulate when I was young. Yeah. You know, I never got close. But those were the guys I looked up to and went, I want to be like them. And, and how about you, Kainoa? Uh, you, you were in, you're involved in um, so many types of riding waves. Um, you know, you spent time surfing. You stand up paddleboard um, and, and surf. And, and what, who are the, the guys that were influencing you? Um, for in your prime. Well, how it started out because I grew up at the wall. Yeah. Um, I got into bodyboarding so early that I basically experienced the the birth and the actual growth. You know, through the nineties and the two thousands, to the you know the big good times of bodyboarding. And growing up at the wall, the the two people who influenced me the most was first was Keith Sasaki. 
Because yeah. he started traveling, he started making money, and he was in the magazines. I was like, wow, that's kind of cool because, like, I know this guy. Like, he's my friend. You know, when, it, when you're that close to somebody and you see them doing it and you're having some success yourself, yeah. it makes you believe that, oh, if he can do it, I can do it. But uh, the biggest influence on me was definitely Kevin Okamura. Mm. And um, most of the people here, or, you know, unless they're a real student of the game, he, you know, he is big back in the 80s and 90s. But, you know, he's this smaller Japanese guy who um, is just crazy. <laughs> and, um, you know, he grew up in, in Kaimuki and went to Jarrett Intermediate. And um, for <laughs> most people are not going to know this either. But at that time, Jarrett Intermediate was right across the street, or still is across the street from the housing but the housing and these projects were full of big, humongous Samoans. Yes, Hawaii right. has projects. <laughs> and, and, and so what happens is he grew up playing football and sports in the street with these kind of guys. And he's the little Japanese guy. So yeah. in order for him to hold his sure own. he wasn't the football? Yeah, no. <laughs> no okay. he, he, he was the guy tackling all these big guys. And I remember seeing him one day at Jared Intermediate playing on the grass with these huge Samoan guys and just like totally fearless. And um, it, it, it rubbed off on me. And also because if I didn't take off on a crazy wave, I'd get punched. So that, did, <laughs> that had a lot to do with it as well. Uh, Dave, um, your, your windsurfing career kind of helped put you on, on the map, so to speak, gave you um, a little bit of a living, but you always had that passion to not only ride the wind, but to ride the waves. Uh, you guys started um, towing in to some crazy waves in like the late 80s, early 90s, um, using Zodiacs, jet skis, pretty much anything that had an engine you're trying to match the power of these huge waves. And uh, I remember some of the first mags I seen that, and I was just like, I thought that was the coolest thing in the whole world. Like, two of my favorite things, like Ditto. speed boats and jet skis yeah. and surfing. I was like, oh, bruh, sign me up. <laughs> how, how did you guys get into that? And, and who, who were the, the core group that, that started doing that? Well, that was spring of 92, if I remember right. And prior to that, maybe for about a year and a half, um, Laird and some of the guys, we, myself, Mark Angulo, Brett Lickle, Rush Randall, Pete Cabrina, um, Derek Dorner, were playing around with foot straps and connected surfing. And kind of after windsurfing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, I mean, we were using windsurfing straps and stuff right. like that. So anyway, <clears throat> Laird did the Velcro thing, and while it made for some cool pictures, it wasn't really that functional. Mm -hmm. But the foot straps were more functional because you could step into them as you stood up. Yep. Um, and basically, almost at the same time as we were figuring out how to do advantage of foot straps, Laird, Derek, and Buzzy were riding big swells towing in on their Waimea guns. And after that swell, they rode over here, came back to Maui. We all kind of joined forces put the towing and the foot straps together, and boom, we were off and running. And uh, we had all known about Piahi or Jaws from windsurfing days, and Jerry Lopez actually shared it with us way back in the day. And uh, I don't know, it was almost like it was meant to be, you know. We stumbled on these components that made it possible, right. and this wave existed in our backyard. Yeah. So peanut butter and jelly kind of <laughs> met right there. And um, Kainoa, your um, bodyboard career was, uh, was decorated with um, a lot of accomplishments. When did um, you start getting the, the stand-up surfing bug? Uh, the stand-up surfing bug actually... Like the tradition of surfing, uh, and, surfing and even stand-up paddleboarding. Well, what happened is uh, the end of 99, basically the end of December, the end of the year into uh, 2000 I had gotten sick I was in the hospital right. in a coma for four days and um, I was blessed enough to get become come out of the coma make a full recovery and uh, wasn't I didn't surf till like a month or so after I got out and one day I showed up at the Volcom house and I was like this sucks. I'm over. I'm not going to body where I was like ready to leave. And Jason Lau's like, bro, we go out. The sandbars are fun. I'm like, bro, it's like two or three feet. Like for me, you know, 
obviously myself and Dave, if you look at us compared to other surfers, we're bigger, right? And so, yeah. like, I've been bodyboarding my whole life. I want the adrenaline rush. I want the late drops, big barrels, spit out, right, kind of thing. And so I was over it, and he's all, well, let's just go surf. I'm like, hmm, okay. So I'm at the vocal miles. I don't have a surf, but I'm running around like, all these little guys, I'm like, okay, yeah, can't use your board. <laughs> not going to use, yeah, yours is like a ski for me. That's not going to happen. And then um, at that time, Sonny Garcia had a bunch of his boards at the house. So I'm like, oh, where's Sonny's boards? Yeah. And, so, and he had like the sick BYB boards and stuff right, back right. then. And so I went and grabbed the biggest one he had at the house because I'm like, <laughs> I don't know how to surf, I can, but I don't know how good I'll be surfing. So I grabbed this 610. And uh, like literally from there, it was that was it. I, you know, I added surfing. Um, you know, a lot of people. Go, oh, when did you switch to surfing? I didn't switch to surfing. I still bodyboard. You just picked it up. Bodyboarding's my roots. That's it. All begins. Everything starts with bodyboarding. So I added surfing, and then uh, like three or four years later, I added longboarding, and then. Um, well, just so you know, just like. All people who walk had to crawl first. Yeah. All people who surf had to bodyboard first, pretty much. Growing up, <laughs> especially here in Hawaii, a lot of yeah. kids, they grow up that way. And, and what's really cool now is I see them all growing up doing everything. Right. It's like they have a friend who bodyboards, a friend who shortboards, a friend who brought out a longboard, a friend who has a stand-up. And then they're like the whole time switching. Yeah. And like so, um, you know, now just like with toe surfing, it started with, quote, unquote, the guys who are older and like we're looking for a new thrill. And stand-up paddle started the same way. It was like, okay, let's do something different. Let's do something better. But now you see these kids growing up. I mean, you know, Kai Lenny, you know, a bunch of the younger kids on Maui are perfect examples. You yeah. see them still kite surfing yeah. into Piahi, towing into Piahi, paddling, paddling into yeah. Piahi, stand-up paddling into Piahi. And, and so what, what's awesome about surfing now is there's so much versatility that everybody's so good on everything mm -hmm. that I think it's, it's going to take the industry to places we've never been because now you don't have these one-trick ponies. Right. Hey, we have a, a little video clip uh, of Kainoa that we're going to watch uh -oh. on this screen here and on the two screens above the bar as well. So let's check it out. I think this is from 2010. Oh, this one. Okay. It's Kainau is the ultimate waterman. I mean, from a bodyboard. Kainau is the ultimate waterman. I mean, from a bodyboarder to a stand-up uh, paddle surfer, he's he's really got it all. He's the ultimate competitor. He's a true warrior in the sense of the, of the word, and um, he's going to be around for a lot of more years. He's super intimidating because he has that look. Because if you look at him from the outside, all you see is the big word fear, but he has a heart, heart of gold. He's, he's hilarious, he's funny, but great guy, awesome waterman, and brother does it all. I was always the kind of guy that I wanted to just go out there and do it and show him that it could be done, and I, and I always had the frame of mind that I always thought that when people say that it can be done, I think, well, you can't do it, but I can, and I'm gonna go out and do it and prove you wrong. What video they were gonna show? <laughs> that, that was safe. That was safe. We actually now have a dancing video of Kainoa. No. <laughs> Sorry, the twerk video we tried to get offline. Uh, Dave, <clears throat> as as stand up paddle, uh, sorry, as um, as toe surfing became more and more popular after that kind of that one session or that one season that you guys had. Um, you know, it was all coming, seemingly all coming out of Maui. It was uh, a, a super pioneering kind of uh, a new movement. Um, what what kind of got you back to, I don't know, stand up paddle boarding and kind of Regular wave ride. getting getting away from the machine? Because there was like a rise of the machines, and then there was a a, a kind of a, a falling back back to the roots kind of thing. What, what, what was uh, your take on that? You know, I don't, I don't know if there was one thing that triggered it. Um, Stand-up is just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And when we got into it, to take it back another step, Laird and I were riding 12-foot longboards 
a lot. That was almost our standard board when we'd go longboarding. So we were, all, we were so close to stand-up that we didn't even know it. Because yeah. a lot of times we'd surf the South Shore, you ride a wave, the wind blows you back out. We wouldn't even you know, lay back down to paddle, just blow back out. And, uh, and then one day I was like, shoot, we're just standing here. I might as well grow, grab the canoe paddles in my truck. Maybe we'll get back out a little quicker. <laughs> And so I did, and while we had to hunch way over to reach the water, and we, we laughed the whole time at each other because it looked so funny, you know, these big guys reaching down to try and touch the water with the canoe paddles. But it was so fun. We realized an hour went by, and we laughed the whole time. I was like, yeah, that was pretty cool, actually. And the waves were knee-high. Yeah. And so Laird went and had paddles made um, as tall as we were, so we wouldn't have to bend over as much. <laughs> and uh, it just was fun. And it was the same reason we got into tow surfing. It was a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. it, it pushed us to kind of the limits of who we were as people in a way. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to get too deep with it, but there, you put yourself in situations from time to time tow surfing that um, you kind of find out what you're made of, yeah. you know? And that's hopefully a good thing because <laughs> yeah. if it doesn't turn out well, it really might not turn out well. But you also, at the same time, um, learn about your friends, who's there, who you can trust, and, and that bond that comes with putting yourself in that situation mm -hmm. and knowing sometimes when things go bad and you're underwater and you're kind of feeling overwhelmed, there's someone up there trying to help me and he's doing everything he can. That gives you confidence, and confidence right. is everything, right? Yep. And so... Uh, the bonds and, and that experience were incredibly fun, but after doing it for about 15 years, um, we were all ready to keep evolving. Yeah. And not that toe surfing isn't fun anymore, but you always want, you always want to learn. Learning yeah. is fun, right? Improving is fun. And when you can find that thing that you become passionate about and you get better, that, that is one of the most fun things that you can do. I, I got to say, one of the things that, that um, I take away from just following um, <clears throat> all your, your uh, accomplishments and things you've done over the years, it seems like you and that crew kind of like they were just Innovators. they were just put on this planet to find a new way to ride a wave to or do another way to ride stuff. <laughs> Like how, how can we have more fun doing this or how can we change it up a little bit? And ride a wave with this or in this manner. So that's, I mean, you've, you guys have um, really been on the map of uh, being innovative, being adaptive, and just at the bottom line, though, trying to have as much fun as you can and push yourself uh, really hard. And Kainoa, I know yeah. you um, now are um, decorated in uh, the types of vehicles that you use to ride waves. Uh, when when was stand up paddleboarding introduced to you? Uh, I actually started in about 2000. Oh no, actually, shoot, was it like 08 or something? And actually, I remember watching Ikaika Kalama, who was supposed to be here as well tonight. Uh, he couldn't make it, but I remember being out at pipe and watching him take off on these waves, <laughs> and I'd be like, "What <laughs> the hell is he <laughs> thinking?" And um, you know, and I jumped up on a Paddle, stand up paddle when I was out the little wave comes and I'm like oh, oh, oh <laughs> baby queen I fought on like three or four times before I even get past baby queen I'm like ah <laughs> and, um, and so I paddle out and um, if any for those of you who do know me I catch a lot of waves when I surf yeah and so I was out there for three hours you and a I, lot of waves yeah, too though exactly I caught I was out for three hours, and I caught three actual waves in three hours. Oh. So needless to say, when I came in, I was pissed. I'm like, <laughs> this is not happening no more. And like, so literally, I went every day after work, and I stand up paddle, and I stand up paddle. So I start off on a 10-6. By the end of the week, in five days, I was on a 9-0. So better, but right. still nowhere good to even be remotely close to where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So I did that for about a month, and then... Um, I had, like, the worst board ever uh, from wet feet at that time. Like, oh, I'm going to take it out to the North Shore, maybe go out to pipe, like, on a small day. And I show up, and it's, like, six to eight feet, and I'm like, hmm. 
ah, screw it, I'm out there. <laughs> and like, it was like the worst, it, it was like the worst board, not made for surfing, like, and pipe is the last place it should have been. Yeah. But, um, you know, like I said, it's, we're addicted to doing stupid stuff. <laughs> and that was definitely stupid. And, uh, and I had a great time. So, of course, it's something different evolving, and, you know, and it, it just all led from there. And, um, you know, my test of myself to see how good I am or to challenge myself is to take whatever that new wave riding vehicle that I'm riding at the time out the pipeline because I know pipeline is, you know, one of the hardest waves to surf in the world no matter how much you know it. But it's, you know, my proving ground, myself personally, as well as, you know, from a lot of the boys here, yourself included. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I know when I get to a point that I'm confident enough to be out there that I'm getting to where I want to be. Right. You know, because for, for me, mediocrity is unacceptable and losing sucks. So either way, <laughs> if, if, if I'm not being able to do it where I want to do it, that's still losing. Yeah. Uh, and Dave, um, being able to ride waves uh, with such innovation, with a lot of different tools, um, but you, you have a, a competition streak in you. Um, I, I, the... Name the way your name came up uh, in the '80s and stuff a lot in the surfing magazines was the pioneering the big waves uh, on Maui and then eventually into the towing and stuff. But uh, you ride a longboard <clears throat> quite a bit also, and uh, you competed uh, in longboarding a, a little bit. Uh, but what what is it about longboarding that uh, makes you feel versatility? Yeah, I. I enjoy getting on the tail and you know surfing ag as aggressively as i possibly can mm -hmm. uh but i also like getting up on the nose at times surfing with a little more style and a little more connectivity from rail to rail mm -hmm. and the the long board's very conducive to that as you know doing spinners hanging five <laughs> seeing how late of a drop you can make on a big old long board just just all the challenges and the fun and the versatility that come with that, yeah. um, I was really attracted to. And I've always kind of ridden bigger boards throughout my surfing career. And so uh, it just fit me. It fit my style. It fit my mentality. And, um, you know, that's kind of what, when you have that open mentality and you kind of come at stuff as a waterman, not purely as a surfer, right. you're open to direction changes and you're open to trying things a different way and, you know, a lot of times some of the stuff that we learn was from mistakes, mm. not necessarily in our little laboratory up on the <laughs> drawing board, like, we need to do this and right. figure it out. <laughs> no, you, you fall or you borrow some piece of equipment and it doesn't work, but boom, this light goes off and you're like, mm. well, if I tweak this, yeah, it could work. Yeah, And that's kind of how we found some of the stuff that we've done. And, and But it all starts with having an open mind and, and that versatility and that... Right. that mentality that kind of comes from longboarding a little bit mm -hmm. lends itself to that that perspective that's 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 a really good point uh kainoa you started surfing pipe on a regular surfboard pretty uh, pretty often um in like early 2000s kind of right after you started surfing you kind of got into surfing pipe and ladies and gentlemen i will tell you as a, a guy who's a couple you know a little bit younger than him but know who he is. He said couple generations. And, and, and know everything about him. And I'm out there surfing pipe. The most coolest thing you can ever hear when you're paddling for a bomb at pipe is kind of going, go rock! <laughs> the whole lineup freezes. You're like, I'm rock. I'm going. And uh, that's something that is, I mean, I, I tell a lot of people, like surfing pipe with you was some of the funnest days uh, ever. And... Um, so we're going to probably start to wind this down, but um, you have kids of your own. You've got uh, a lot of history in, in surfing and wave riding culture behind you. Uh, what would you say maybe your legacy would be, uh, you know, going down the road? Or what would you think, you know, people, you want people to, to say about you or know about you, about Kainoa? Um. <clears throat> And actually, especially when I was younger, I used to get asked that question a lot. And um, the answer was kind of the same for a while. And I was, well, you know, big wave charger and world champion. And I did this and I did that. Um, at the stage in my life where I am now, I like to actually be remembered for the things that 
I'm going to do. Like the stuff we want to do that, you know, I'm working on opening my own surf school and starting a nonprofit foundation and, and doing a lot of the stuff, giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. I've been, we, are, yourself included, all of us as professional athletes um, have been given so much our whole life. And I noticed in the industry as a whole, there's not enough giving back. And uh, uh, I definitely want to make sure that anything I do moving forward, wherever we go doing what we're doing, that we're always giving back in the communities that we're a part of when we travel, when we're here at home. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think, you know, what Dwayne DeSoto is doing with Nakama Kai, yep. you know, is awesome. You know, and, yep. I, and then a lot of the guys now, as they're getting older, are starting to realize this as well. And I'm hoping that while we still have a little spotlight left on us, that we can make make this place a better place and show that surfers do actually give back too. Right. And, and Dave, you've, um, you've had a, a, a varied waterman existence uh, on, on this planet. Um, and you too are also going to be watching uh, your son compete in the upcoming stand-up paddle World Tour event at Sunset Beach. Um, what's uh, what's the Dave Kalama legacy, or, or the the maybe the creed, or something that you want to be known by? Well, that <laughs> no softball. <laughs> <laughs> you he know, did it. No. Yeah, he did <laughs> great. How do I follow that? And thanks for everybody for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs> Good night, good night. Elvis no. left the building. Um, you know, I, I guess I want to be thought of as someone that gave uh, back to the community or to surfing. Listen, you know, yeah. we're talking about surfing. Right. Um, obviously, surfing has given me so much, so much more than I probably ever deserved or mm -hmm. thought I would get. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if I can help... That's great. You know, I'm trying to share my information or my knowledge with my son, but right. I try and do it with other people around me. You know, people come ask me questions. I try and answer and and help them and stuff. But uh, you know what? I think I want to be known as a Kalama mm -hmm. that carried on the Kalama name. My dad, my grandfather. What they did and what they accomplished was all word of mouth, like you mentioned earlier in your, your introduction. And um, we have the benefit of social media today, <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's, it's much more kind of in your face, and you can see what we're doing, and we make ourselves accessible. But what they accomplished was every bit as significant as, as probably anything we've done. And so to carry on that name and, and maybe pass it on to my son or my sons, I've got three of them, mm -hmm. um, Hopefully that keeps going, and, and I represented myself well. I represented the family well, mm -hmm. and contributed to surfing. And if if people remember me for that, I would be stoked. And I think um, I like to say something real quick to that mm -hmm. is um, that the legacy that Dave and you know Laird and that group of guys. Um, Gave have already given back. They don't have to do anymore because they've actually created industries, right? You got the jet ski companies like trying to customize the skis so that they work better on waves, which right. they never did was all lakes and yeah. flat stuff, right? So that's already a contribution that they <laughs> made. You know, obviously the toe surfing. I mean, these guys were doing it on like seven, ten huge boards, and now yeah. like, people are riding like five foot boards and six foot boards. Um, you know, obviously, stand-up paddle is its own industry, right, with racing, with the surfing and all that kind of stuff. And um, to me, that for me, for guys like Dave, you know, I'm lucky to call him my cousin and, and the family. But to that whole generation or the, that whole group of guys who are forerunners pushing that, um, for me, that's definitely the legacy that they left. And I, I want to thank them for that because without them, I'd still be sitting here probably as a bodyboard and maybe surfing, but wouldn't have taken over stand-up paddle and even for all the younger guys and girls in the room who are all into it. Um, you know, let's all give Dave a big hand for that because without them, we'd still be doing whatever it was we did before. Easy, bro. Serious. Well, 
What was that, Christian? Say again. I got <laughs> I hear voices. <laughs> um, well, folks, um, it, it's needless to say that uh, Kainua McGee and Dave Kalama, um, if and when uh, the time calls, uh, the Surfing Hall of Fame is probably waiting for them, uh, at least in my book, in my vote. Uh, these guys know how to ride waves, they know how to ride them well, and they know how to ride them with any piece of equipment that you put in front of them. And I think that's probably the takeaway of this evening is to realize that no, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're riding, um, it, it's all a matter of getting out in the ocean and enjoying it and sharing it, uh, building a camaraderie, a community, a sense of community with other people that ride waves and um, you know, enjoy riding waves with your, your fellow brethren and sisters, no matter what they're riding some of are not even riding anything at all, body surfers. But there's so many ways to ride waves, you guys. Get out there and enjoy the ocean. Uh, it's for us here. And the more we enjoy it, the more we're going to respect it and protect it. Uh, you guys, it's been a wonderful evening. Uh, Kaido McGee, give it up for one more time for Brother Kaido. Much mahalos. And Dave Kalama, please give it up for Brother Dave. And on behalf 